the message tonight we want to try to share in um, <clears throat> Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. We've been in the Sermon on the Mount, and it's always a blessing to me to dig in to this and try to understand better what our Lord is trying to say and how He's trying to say it, why He's trying to say it the way He's saying it, and knowing that um, you can't, you, you can take something that He said and just probably it took Him 30 seconds to, to speak, maybe a minute, uh, a few verses, and then you can go and you could try to preach on it for however long I preach. I don't want to like to put the tie numbers to that. And, and you know you've not even scratched the surface yeah. because this is the Word of God. And, and it's, such a, it's such a treasure that we have. And I hope we don't ever um, lose sight of that beauty that we have. And, and this topic is very much in, 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 tied in with what uh, Brother Lee's talking about. It's talking about <coughs> our treasure, where our treasure is at. And we've been, as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, we spent the last couple times looking at, uh, we looked about forgiveness um, last Sunday, and then before that it was looking about uh, at prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and trying to, to think about that. And, and so we've, we've been going through this, and tonight we want to try to cover from verse 29, or verse 19, excuse me, to verse 24. Um, Matthew chapter 6, we'll read this together. It says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye, if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, as we read through this, maybe you notice there's kind of three different things going on there. There was first the talk about where to lay up your treasure. And then there's this discussion about uh, the light of the body being the eye. And then we get down to verse 24, and it's about no man can serve two masters. Aren't these kind of three different things? I don't believe it is. I believe Jesus is taking the same thought that he introduces us to in verse 19, and he develops it. And I'll, I'll try to show you that in a second. But even positionally, this passage is setting us up for where Jesus is about to teach us to not worry about things. He is setting us up to teach us about anxiety in our life and seeking first the kingdom and that God's going to take care of your needs. And so this passage is right before that. And, and what he's doing is he's telling us not to spend our life focused on worldly things. And he's going to tell us after he's taught us to not do that, and he's given us reasons for not doing that, he's then going to say, and because I'm telling you not to focus on worldly things, I want you to know that I'm going to take care of you. I can take care of the worldly things you need if you seek me first. Okay, so all of these things tie up together. But here in, in verse 19, we see about not laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven, Okay, and what I want to point out in verse 24 is he says at the very end, you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon means money or wealth. And so you see this connection from verse 24 back to verse 19 that he's speaking about something, uh, one, one principle here. And we're going to see a progression of this principle through three illustrations. And the title of our message tonight is Location, Location, Location. Maybe you've heard that 
before. That's a common real estate phrase, right? The value of a home or piece of property. It comes down to location, location, location. You can have a total dive that is located in a spot that is growing and thriving and people will offer you crazy money for it because of where it's at. Conversely, you can have a wonderful house that is way outpriced for the neighborhood and you will not get nearly as much as you've put into it. Location, location, location. And the reason that I say that as we look at this passage, we'll, we'll get into this more in a second, is that this is what the Lord is trying to focus us on, is where our treasures are. So here in verses 19 through 21, he says to lay not up for ourselves treasures upon earth. Now, what I, it was interesting, okay, um, as I was digging into this and studying that the Greek word for lay not up is thesaurizo, and the Greek word for treasures is thesaurus. Both words are of the same derivation, the, thesaurizo and thesaurus. And so, like in the Greek, when Jesus was, you know, if he spoke this in Greek, I probably spoke it in Aramaic, but when this was in Greek, it sounds kind of like treasure not up, treasures for yourself. Okay? There's kind of a little bit of a play on words going on. And to lay not up means to store up, heap up, treasure up. It's talking about excess, treasures, meaning things of value and worth. Things that are of value and worth. And this passage is not discouraging work. It's not discouraging responsible savings. This passage is about the pursuit of earthly excess. Okay? This passage is about pursuing and making as your goal, your desire, your one thing, piling up earthly excess. And this passage is not against seeking treasure. It's about where your treasure is. It's about what your treasure is. It's about this idea that you've got an energy and ability that you can put forth into doing something and getting valuable things from that effort. And it's not discouraging us from that. It's just encouraging us to seek up the right treasures that are in the right place and discouraging us from looking for less valuable treasures that are found in the wrong place. And this isn't just about money. It can be about any earthly thing that we would exalt above God. Anything. The question I want to ask you and to think about this as we look at this passage tonight is, where is my greatest joy found? Where is my greatest joy found? This morning, we talked about that passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6, a really significant passage to the Jewish people, and it's significant to us today that our God is God alone. There is no other gods besides Him, and we are to love Him with all of our soul and our heart and our strength, and that His Word is set to be treasured in our heart, and we are meant to teach it and pass it down diligently to another generation. And the, the theme of that passage is that God needs to be our treasure. That He is our treasure. And so as we look at this passage, we need to think about, is the Lord my treasure? And He's wanting us to make Him our treasure. He's wanting us to seek first the kingdom as He's going to tell us later in this chapter, verse 33, we'll get there someday, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, make His things the number one priority, the, the greatest joy, the consuming passion of your life, and everything else is going to fall in place. And He's giving us in these verses here from 19 to 24, I believe four reasons why? Four reasons why we should not pursue earthly excess, but we should pursue heavenly treasure. And number one reason is that earthly treasures depreciate, decay, and disappear. Earthly treasures depreciate, decay, and and disappear. No doubt, the Smiths over there 
lost a many a sale from people who did not want to buy a car from them because they knew as soon as they drove it off the lot, the value was going to drop. Now, no doubt they were good salesmen, and they, they did fine. But there's a lot of folks who just don't want to buy a new car because you know as soon as you do and you drive it off, the value has just dropped. There is a depreciation that, that, that happens. And it's not just those types of things. It's about everything. There are some things that, you know, based on the market can appreciate in value, but, but largely the things that we invest ourselves in in this world, they depreciate, they decay, and they can disappear. If it's really worth that much, somebody else is trying to get it, and they're trying to get it from you. And that's the warning that, that Jesus is giving here. And, and in this passage where Jesus is speaking to us in verses 19 and 20 and 21, he uses this word where, how many times? Five times, and he uses one there. He says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where, the place, where moth and rust corrupts and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where, neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal, for where your treasure is, there in that place will your heart be also. See, location, location, location. And the significance of having a misplaced joy, and by that I mean having our joys, our greatest joys, our greatest passion, our greatest drive in this life tied to earthly things, the greatest risk we run, and it's not just a risk, it's a reality, if our passion is found in the things of this world, what we will end up with are empty hands. You will labor for the things that will not last. You will have placed your heart and your greatest joy in things that will disappear. You cannot take it with you. We all know that. This uh, Friday, when we went out to, to Bowling Green, um, we got there a little bit early, and we had some spare time. And I, I took, uh, I took uh, the brothers with me to uh, the Fairview Memorial Graveyard, wherein is buried uh, Brother J.M. Pendleton. Some of you recognize that name. Brother Donald told me that he did not realize that was on his bucket list, but as soon as he realized that was a possibility, his bucket list just got a little bigger. Uh, Brother J.M. Pendleton uh, has been a, a significant uh, figure in missionary Baptist history. Uh, his handbook um, on, on how churches should work has been used uh, for many, many years. He has an excellent book on doctrine, Christian doctrine, that has uh, been, uh, been a great help to uh, many, many missionary Baptists. And there in that graveyard was a really nice uh, obelisk with his, uh, where he was buried and his wife and some of the family members. And it was an old graveyard, very neat to see a lot of those old graves. But as typical with the old graveyard, and it was very well kept as some of those stones, even those stones, the last things, <laughs> The last things, those uh, representation of their lives were, were fading and were hard to read for some of them. Even those things that we try to do that we think will last to represent our life will only last for so long. Will only last for so long. The great pyramids built, you know, the archaeologists struggled to try to figure out like, who exactly was buried here, <laughs> Right? And these are these great, huge monuments. So many grave sites of people have been lost to history. Even significant people, such as Alexander the Great, struggled to know where they were buried. All those things are going to fade. And if we've made the things of this world our greatest joy, we will ultimately have empty hands. Amen. The second reason... Uh, that Jesus gives us in this same passage for having our joys in heavenly things is in verse 21. He says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know a treasure map, right? X marks the spot. 
That's how you find out where the treasure is at. You get the map and you see the X and you go find where that is. Jesus says, look, where your treasure is, X marks the spot, not to where the treasure is, but where your heart is. And we spend a lot of time talking about the significance of the heart, right? That from the heart flow all the issues of your life. And so Jesus is saying, look, if you've made the things of the world your treasure, that is where your heart is going to be. That is going to be the magnetic north of the compass of the direction of your life. Because where you are seeking and trying to find your greatest joy, you're going to find that all the things in your life are going to flow to you trying to get to that, toward that thing. And it's going to orient your entire life. There's not any other way about it. And so as you think about the direction of your life and, and what will I leave behind, what, you know, I, if I can know, I can recognize here, God's Word says that if I pursue the things of this world and they become the most important thing to me, I'm going to end up empty-handed and my, my whole life is going to be pointed in that direction and I want my life to matter. I want things that last. I want to leave a real legacy. I want treasure in heaven, a place where there is no depreciation or decay, where nothing is going to disappear. I want that. Well, recognize that our heart is going to have to shift. Our heart is going to have to shift. There's going to have to be a move inside us. And this is a perfect transition to this next illustration. So reason one for having your treasure in heaven is that so you're not empty-handed. And number two, because that where is where your heart's going to be. That's going to be the direction of your life. The third reason here in verses uh, 22 and 23 Jesus says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. I think this is such a, a profound truth, and I hope I can kind of lay it out to help you see what this means. Um, don't lose sight about that statement about the heart that we just made, because I think it'll help us understand this. Jesus says, look, the light of the body is the eye. I was just talking to, to Brother Diamond right before service, and I know he's going to have his, some eye surgery, hopefully, and, and get some things worked out, because he's struggling being able to see right now, and he's had his Bible on his phone, and he had it blown up really big with a black background and white letters trying to read, and it's bothering him because he can't see to read the Word like he would like to. And it's something that is impacting his whole life right now. Our ability to see and to see clearly, and to be able to focus, it impacts the health and effectiveness of our entire body. I know talking to Brother Harold, who's suffered through some eye issues, and, and after having, um, I, I, I messed up trying to say what exactly all happened to you, but it, it took him quite a while to figure out how to do a lot of things again. It was a struggle. In fact, there were a lot of things he thought he could never do. And it wasn't just like, oh, I can't see out of this eye. I carry on. It's like, no, like everything in his life was kind of hanging and hinging upon his ability to see. And Jesus is using that as an analogy here. He says, look, if, if your eye is single, and in this case it means able to clearly focus, if your eye is healthy, well, that's a blessing to your entire body. To your entire life because I mean if you can't see there's a lot of things you run into right there's a lot of things that you run into there's a lot of things that you can't do there's a lot of ways you can't care for your body and there's a lot of things you're not even able to do just in life to be able to function the way you would like to and so he says it, the light of the body because it infects your entire life it affects your entire body it's not like just having a sore finger okay the eyes are so significant. If therefore your eye is single and if it's healthy, your whole body is full of light. It can be a blessing to all of you. But if your eye is evil, in this case meaning bad, unhealthy, unable to focus or see clearly, 
then your whole body is full of darkness. It impacts all of you. Having poor eyesight like this can wreak havoc and damage upon our entire body. And Jesus makes the point, if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? It seems like he's talking about more than just eyesight, isn't he? He's talking about something more than just seeing. There was a Stoic philosopher of ancient Rome named Seneca. And in one of the letters he wrote, he tells of an ignorant slave in his house. So this was a slave he had that was not all there mentally. And this slave suddenly became blind, just kind of like overnight lost their eyesight. And this is what he said. Now, incredible as the story seems, it is really true that she is unconscious of her blindness and consequently begs her attendant to go elsewhere because she thinks the house is just dark. But you may be sure that this, at which we laugh in her, happens to us all. No one understands that he is greedy or covetous. The blind, they know enough to seek for a guide. We wander about without a guide. The point of, of his illustration was that his slave, this, this woman, when she became blind, she didn't realize she became blind. She just thought it was dark in the house. And so she just thought it was still night. I mean, she just, she just didn't get it. And when the attendant came to try to guide her to do something, she's like, no, 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 it's still dark in the house. Leave me alone. This is bedtime. She didn't realize she was blind. And he said, of course, you know, they, they all poked fun at it. He goes, but that kind of blindness, the kind of blindness that you're ignorant of, the kind of blindness that you don't see, that you don't realize, that can happen to every single one of us. Yeah. Think about this example with me of, of, of Jesus speaking to the Pharisees in John chapter 9. Jesus had just healed, uh, uh, as I recall here, a man that was born blind. And the Pharisees were very upset. And they didn't want to believe his testimony that Jesus had done it. And Jesus, as at the end of this chapter, he's speaking about spiritual blindness. And Jesus said in John chapter 9, verse 39, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind." And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Yes, these men were blind. And Jesus said, If you knew that you were blind, and if you knew that you couldn't see, and if you knew that I could help you, then your sin could be taken away and you could see. But you, who really are blind, you think you can see. You don't realize that you're blind and therefore your sin remains. You see, their hearts were what? Jesus said these Pharisees, their hearts were directed toward the praise of men. They love the praise of men more than they love the praise of God. And because their treasures were of this earth, their hearts were of this earth, they were blind. They could not even see and perceive their own sin. And so it is with every one of us when we were lost until the Holy Spirit came 
And that conviction came and it opened our eyes to show us that we were blind and we needed to be able to see. And praise God, He showed us that. Praise God, He convinced us of that. Praise God, He got us to that place where we cried out to God as blind men, Lord, and trying to feel around, like Paul said, as, as if happily we might find Him. And praise God, as blind men seeking, the Lord came and made Himself known to us, saved us, opened our eyes, and let us see. But even as Christians, even as Christians, if we start to seek the treasures of this world and our hearts go toward them, we can get blind. Yeah. Go with me to Revelation chapter 3. This was in Sunday school this morning. Brother <laughs> Stephen Vinson and uh, Brother Adam Steele are teaching through Revelation and we were jumping around talking about the different churches. And the church of Laodicea came up in our discussion. And I'm going to read from verses 14 to 18. It says, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These saying things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Listen. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, true treasure, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. If that doesn't tie together with Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23, you need to get me out of the pulpit. Because that's just as clear of a tie as you can see. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about. These people thought they had it. These Christians in this church thought, we're on the right track. We're so blessed. We are so rich. They had been pursuing the wrong kinds of treasures. And they thought they had a lot of it. And Jesus is saying, you don't have anything. Your hands are going to be empty. Your heart is in the wrong spot. You don't even see because you are blind that you are poor and blind naked. You don't even know. You see, this is reason number three that Jesus gives us back here in Matthew chapter 6 that we need not seek and make our greatest joy the treasures of this world because misplaced joys result in a life consumed with darkness. You want to talk about being insensitive to the Spirit of God. If your treasure is not of God, if it's not the things of God, but it's the things of the world, you are not going to be sensitive to the Spirit of God. You're not going to even be able to see yourself with any clarity. They were so entangled at that church with material wealth that they had bad eyes and they didn't even know that they had nothing. Finally, the fourth reason in verse 24, Matthew 6, 24. Jesus says, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. The illustration here, in a sense, is he's going from eyesight... Okay, talking about having poor eyesight, and now he transitions to somebody trying to have their focus in two different places. Trying to look at two different things at the same time. Trying to follow two different masters in this, at the same time. And, and Jesus is making the point, you cannot do this. 
You cannot live a double life. You cannot go after both of these things. You always make a choice. And your choice is going to flow from your heart. And if you've made the things of this world your treasure, that's where your heart's going to be. You don't even really see that you have a problem. And when it comes time to make choices, and there will be times to make choices, you're going to go after the other master, and you're going to leave the Lord. Okay? You can't do it. This is why Joshua told the Israelites, and we talked about it a few Sundays ago, choose this day whom you're going to serve. You've got to make a clear choice. You've got to choose a clear direction. You've got to make a clear commitment. You need to know what that's about, and you need to go hard after him. Because misplaced joys, misplaced treasures, will result in hatred or resentment toward the Lord. Because rather than seeing him as the treasure of your life, you see him as the one who's keeping you from your treasure. You want to go do this other thing. You want to pursue this other thing that you think is going to make you happier and you've got this guilt trip from God and you start to resent God because He wants you to do this, but I really want to do this. And so you're back and forth and it really hurts your relationship with the Lord. And I'll tell you, that, is, that fourth reason is the greatest danger. And it's the most significant and profound reason to seek the right treasure that's in the right location that's in heaven because it is going to hurt our relationship with our God it's not going to sever our relationship as a child of God but we all know that there can be estranged children still children but estranged and we don't want to be estranged children of our Lord. And so here in this passage, Jesus lays it out. He lays it out from start to finish. He tells us what we need to treasure and tells us what the dangers, the consequences are if our treasure is not in the right place. Folks, you cannot have it all in this world. You cannot have it all in this world. You have to choose your treasure. And you need to choose wisely. If you seek the world, you will lose your treasure. If you seek the world, your heart will never rise higher than this world. If you seek the world, your life will be bathed in darkness. If you seek the world, you will resent Christ and His calling. But if you seek first the kingdom, you will never lose your treasure. If you seek first the kingdom, your heart will be anchored in heaven. If you seek first the kingdom, your, light will be, your life will be bathed in light. And if you seek first the kingdom, you will grow in your love and devotion to Jesus Christ. Amen. There's... There's two different paths. So where's your treasure? What will you leave behind? What will last from your life? Location, location, location. Where your treasure is, that's what matters. God bless you tonight.